We come in our study of the Gospel of Luke to one of the most moving passages in all the Word of God. It's only four verses, but it's one of the most amazing accounts where Jesus tells his disciples he's about to suffer. This is the third time that Jesus has spoken about his impending death in the Gospel of Luke. Everything the prophets predicted is about to be accomplished. His suffering would simply be a fulfillment of the Father's intentions from the very beginning. His suffering would secure the salvation for every man, woman, boy, and girl who believes for all time. And there are prophecies written about Jesus and about this experience 500 to 1,000 years before he was even born. Jesus was assuring his disciples that when all this begins in a few days, that everything's going according to plan, God's plan. And here with prophetic inevitability and pinpoint accuracy, he predicts exactly what's going to happen to him. Now, you know, if that's all he had told them, that would have been the most discouraging news anyone had ever heard. The story wouldn't end with Jesus' death. They were expecting a Messiah who would overthrow Rome and oversee a messianic kingdom of peace and prosperity for all the Jewish people. Eventually, after the resurrection, not only did they get it, but they gave their very lives preaching and proclaiming it to everyone they could find. Paul said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. If we could just get you to the cross this morning, We can help you find your way home. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. You're a part of history again this morning. We're completing the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke together, which is phenomenal. And uh, what I will tell you, just a quick commercial, uh, next week's message goes along with what we're talking about this week and what we talked about a couple weeks ago, in case you're wondering, how will all that tie together? That's my job. I'll do that for you. But once we get into Luke chapter 19, we're in the final seven days of Jesus' life. And all the events unfold rapidly, leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel of Luke ends with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his commission to his disciples, and it's going to be phenomenal. And as I've told you before, Lord willing... We will finish the Gospel of Luke uh, this fall in October. But today the text before us is the first of actually a two-part series within this series. What did Jesus say to the man who had nothing? Next week we'll look at what Jesus said to the man who had everything. So all of us are covered in here somewhere. And uh, so Luke 18, I'll be there in just a moment, verse 35. In August 2001, as an American Airlines 777 jetliner arriving from overseas descended into John F. Kennedy Airport in New York and lowered its landing gear, the frozen body of a man fell into a marsh beneath the field's approach lanes. The body, believed to be that of a young Nigerian, was buried in a plain wooden casket in City Cemetery, the resting place of New York City's indigents commonly known as the potter's field. No one will ever know for certain, but it appears the young man, who carried no identification, had hidden in the wheel well of the jet, hoping to steal into the United States. If, as police speculated, he was from an African village, he might not have known that the temperature outside of a jetliner at cruise altitude may be minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and that wheel wells are unheated. They are also not pressurized, rendering breathing almost impossible at a jetliner's cruise altitude. Or the victim may have known these things and was so desperate and decided to get into the wheel well anyway to see what might happen. You see, desperate people who have nothing and have nothing to lose will do some pretty desperate things. We meet a man like that in our text this morning. We actually will meet three men and see three miracles in the city of Jericho. These three men are the final trophies of God's sovereign saving grace until the cross. The healing of blind Bartimaeus, who we will see this morning, and an unnamed blind friend that Matthew mentions in Matthew chapter 20. 
and the miracle salvation of the tiny tax collector named Zacchaeus, whom we will see next week, Lord willing. One commentator said, from here on out, from Jericho on in the final week, there are no stories of conversion. There are no stories of salvation in Jerusalem in these last days. There are, however, at the very end, two unique conversions that occur right when Christ is crucified, the thief and the centurion. But in the last week before his death, no conversions are recorded. This is a tragic, sad drama of suffering all the way to the cross. The events in Jericho provide the last shining light before the darkness of Christ's suffering begins. There is not one joyful note from the time he walks out of Jericho until he is nailed to the cross. And yet the Hebrew writer says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He went joyfully. He went purposefully. I always tell my grandsons when we're together, walk like you know where you're going. Jesus walked like he knew where he was going. Now Jericho was known as the city of Palms. It's about a six-hour walk straight up to Jerusalem. It's the same place as the ancient city whose walls came tumbling down when Joshua and the Israelites seized the city. Remember, they marched around it for seven days. They blew trumpets. They shouted. It had recovered from those darker days. It had become a flourishing city. In fact, according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, it had been rebuilt by Herod with a fort and with an incredible palace where he eventually died. Years later, Mark Antony gave the city as a gift to Cleopatra. Now nearby Jericho, a massive rock formation casts its shadow every night over Jericho as the sun sets. It's a region of steep cliffs and severe drops and deep canyons. A number of people from our church have been there. And it's up on that area where most scholars believe Jesus was taken to be tempted by Satan. So we're in the city of Jericho, are you with me? And we pick up the narrative in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 35. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? As Jesus drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. The first thing we notice in our text is his condition. As he drew near to Jericho, Jesus is walking, and a blind man is sitting by the roadside begging. Mark identifies him as Bartimaeus, a a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, Mark 10, 46. Now, you know when Jesus was here on earth, he demonstrated supernatural power over demons and disease and even death. He healed all kinds of people. He healed all kinds of sickness and disease. Ironically, The Bible records more cases of Jesus healing people who were blind than any other disease. And the most famous of all those stories is this story, the story of blind Bartimaeus. Now, in Mark's account of this healing of Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, it follows the occurrence of James and John. Remember when they said to Jesus, Lord, can we have the seats of honor? Can one of us sit on the right hand and on the left hand when you come into your kingdom? Remember that? 
Ray Stedman said, and I quote, you notice there's an unusual repetition in mentioning the name of this man. And this is from Mark's account. We are told that Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. The name Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. So it's really redundant to say Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, because they mean the same thing. So in a sense, this name is being underscored for us as is no other name in the account. There must be something about this name that Mark wanted us to note. When you look up the Greek meaning of Timaeus, you discover why. The name means honor. This beggar was named the son of honor. Now what was it that James and John had asked Jesus for? Honor, was it not? That we may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But here was a blind man named the son of honor who sat beside the road. And Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Exactly the same words he'd ask of James and John. What was the trouble with these disciples? They were blind, were they not? They could not see what was involved. They wanted something, but they did not see what was connected with it. They could not see the cup, the baptism, the hurt, the cross. They were blind. What was the matter with Bartimaeus? He was physically blind. And Jesus asked in both cases, what do you want me to do for you? Now, in Luke's account, the healing of the blind man follows the disciples not being able to see any of the things that Jesus had just told them about his suffering and his crucifixion. They didn't get it. Now, Bartimaeus may have never seen a sunrise or a sunset. He may have never seen a tree or a flower. He may have never seen the stars shining bright on a warm summer's night. He may have never seen his father or his family He may have lived his entire life in utter darkness. We don't know, as we'll see in a couple of moments. But Bartimaeus is a picture to us of something. He is a picture to us of the condition of people outside of Christ. It's a horrible condition and a horrible thing to be blind physically, but there's a blindness that's worse than that, spiritual blindness. Is that the reason why there are more accounts of Jesus healing physically blind people in the Bible than any other? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul warned the Ephesians not to walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. You know, if I didn't already know about spiritual blindness, I would have no way to explain some of the people that we see on television or leading our country or making decisions. If I didn't know about spiritual blindness, I'd say, are these aliens? No, they're people just like us, but their minds have been darkened by the God of this world. You see, spiritual blindness, that's, that's a perfect description of our world today, completely blind to the seriousness of sin and the consequences that are coming. As a blind man, Bartimaeus lived with the constant danger, not knowing where his next step would take him. Our world is in the same shape. They have no idea they're in danger of spending an eternity in a Christless, godless pit of everlasting fiery torment and terror engulfed in complete darkness. They have no clue about that. Don't you think if they knew that was really coming, they would change? They would change. In verse 35, Luke says he was sitting by the roadside begging. No one wanted anything to do with this guy. No one wanted to help him. Oh, every once in a while, there'd be someone who'd say, okay, here's, here's a shekel. Here's a little cup of water. But most people wanted nothing to do with him. No one would give him a job. What was he going to do? 
Now, thanks to the miracles of technology, there are a lot of things that people who do not have their sight can do today, thanks to, thanks to computers and all kinds of other things that we've been able to develop, and that's wonderful. But he, he had none of that. So he was reduced to sitting by the roadside begging for handouts for everything. He was completely destitute, poor beyond description. Again, a perfect description of those who are lost, spiritually destitute and eternally impoverished. So we see his condition. Notice his cry, verse 36 to 38. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what it all meant, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He heard the commotion of the crowd. He said, what's going on? And the people said, it's Jesus coming. So he cried out. By the way, the word used here is a very strong word. The word that Mark uses is the word for shout. The word that Matthew uses is the word for scream. The word that Luke uses is to yell. You get the picture of what they're trying to convey? This man cried at the top of his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, here was a man who used to beg for money, but now he's begging for mercy. Friend, you're going to get to the place in your life when you realize money can't do what you need done. Money can't get you where you need to get. Money can do a lot of things, but friend, when it comes to eternity, all the money in the world can't help you. Only Jesus. He cried out for mercy. And by the way, when he called Jesus the son of David, he proved he had insight that some of the people who had 20-20 vision didn't have. He recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. That's what son of David meant. The Bible predicted the Messiah would give sight to blind eyes. Isaiah 35, 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Remember when John the Baptist was locked up in prison? And he started hearing about all the things that Jesus was doing, and he said to his disciples, Go and ask him if he's the Messiah or if we should wait for someone else. Remember that? Remember what Jesus told John's disciples, Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 and 5? He said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. John would have known this is him. This is the Messiah. This blind man cried out for mercy. He didn't demand his rights. What a difference from our culture today, right? Everyone's crying out about their rights and what they're entitled to and what they deserved and what we ought to be doing for all these people because they deserve this. It's not what he said. Friend, are you one of those people that wants your rights? I have to tell you this morning, I don't want my rights. If if I got my rights, I'd be in hell for eternity. And don't sit there all spiritual. You'd be there too. We don't have a right to God's salvation. We don't have a right to God's forgiveness. We don't have a right to God's heaven. (laughs) No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to demand my rights. I'm going to get in line with Bartimaeus and I'm going to cry out for mercy. I'm not going to say, give me what I deserve. No, 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 please. No, give me what I don't deserve. Amen. Psalm 51, verse 1, David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. I love what Paul told the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. He said that God is rich in mercy. He's got so much mercy that you and I don't even know about. In fact, uh, uh, Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations, his mercies are new every morning. You know what that means? That means that that God is thinking of ways tonight to forgive you for tomorrow because he knows you're going to mess up again. He's got new mercies for you. That doesn't mean you ought to go out and sin. Paul said, shall we sin so that grace may abound? No. We ought to be motivated to live for Jesus. So we see his condition, we see his cry. Notice thirdly, his critics, you've got to be kidding me, a blind man had critics? Uh Uh-huh, we all do. Verse 39, notice what the people did. Here was this blind beggar sitting by the side of the road. He wants to get to Jesus, and what do the people in the crowd do? Shut up, be quiet. 
Stay out of this. Really? They rebuked him. Luke makes it very clear, verse 39, and those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Friend, when you want to get to Jesus, you decide you want to get to Jesus, there will be people who will always try to talk you out of it. Or they'll try to keep you somehow from doing it. They'll try to stop you. You've got to be like blind Bartimaeus. He just cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Fred Craddock said, and I quote, It is striking that in the story before us, Jesus opens the eyes of a man who can already see. The blind beggar calls Jesus Son of David. That is Messiah. In this sense, he can see what this crowd cannot. For the crowd, in their rebuke of him, revealed its own blindness. Don't let people who are spiritually blind keep you from getting to the light. If you want to be saved, don't let anybody talk you out of it. If you want to live for Jesus and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, don't let a single cynic or skeptic or hypocrite or critic or whoever stop you. The world will try every way it can to stop you or stifle you. They'll mock you. They'll make fun of you. They'll they'll ridicule you. You just be like old blind Bartimaeus and cry out all the more. Jesus, help me. Well, notice finally his cure, verse 40. It says, and Jesus stopped. He stopped. I love that. Did you know that when you cry out to Jesus, he'll stop everything just for you? That's what he did for this blind man. Jesus stopped and he commanded that this man be brought to him. Jesus commanded the very people who'd been telling the blind man to be quiet. He commanded them, you bring him to me. Now there's some tremendous irony in that statement. They'd been trying to hinder this man from getting to Jesus, and now Jesus says, you help him get to me. Somebody had to help him get to Jesus. I sure hope you're helping people get to Jesus and not hindering them. Mark tells us, he got up and throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, he had to have some people help him get to him, but, but, but he threw his cloak off, his beggar's coat. He was literally saying, I'm done with this old life. I'm going to Jesus. He knew everything was going to change. He was a blind beggar with nothing. But he knew it was about to change. Why? He was coming to Jesus. And so throwing off his cloak, he sprang up. He came to Jesus. Now, I love the fact that he threw off his old beggar's coat because he didn't want anything to keep him from getting to Jesus. Are you hanging on to something this morning that's keeping you from Jesus? Or someone? Whatever it is, throw it off. Get rid of it. Nothing's worth keeping you from Jesus. And he got to Jesus in verse 41. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I know someone will say, well, you know, I mean, come on, Jesus, can't you tell the guy's blind? I mean, it's pretty obvious what he needs. Can I tell you something I know about you and something I know about me? What we need in our lives is obvious to everybody else but us. What we need to change, what we need to focus on, what, we need to, what needs to be the, 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 the main thing that we need to be doing right now, everybody, it's obvious to everybody else. We can look in the mirror and not see it. Now, that's not the issue. Jesus knew what was wrong. He wanted to hear this. He wanted this man to say, here's, here's, here's what I want. And he said, Lord. Do you notice he called Jesus Lord? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. I want to see. Now, remember I told you earlier, we don't know whether he'd never seen a sunset or a sunrise or his father or his family, whatever. When he said, I'd like to recover my my sight, it may imply that he had not been born blind, but somewhere along the way, he he had lost his sight. We don't really know. In verse 42, Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. 
And immediately he recovered his sight, and he followed him, glorifying God, Luke says. Now the earth didn't shake. There was no trumpet blast from heaven. There was no angelic chorus to appear to announce the miracle. Now Matthew does tell us that he touched the eyes of Bartimaeus and the other blind man who was with him. Luke only tells us about one. But the word translated well is not the word for heal. Your faith has made you well. It's not the word for heal. It's sozo in the Greek. It's the word for salvation. You're not just getting your physical eyesight back. You're getting spiritualized. You really can see now. You're saved. And it was instantly noticeable to the crowd because verse 43 says, all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This was undeniable, irrefutable. Jesus had touched this man. Can I ask you a question this morning? Is it undeniable and irrefutable that Jesus has touched you? Or would people say about you, you you, you go to church? That's something to think about. So all the people, they, they praise God. This man, he got in line following Jesus. He joined this massive crowd of people who were following Jesus. And by the way, this miracle and the the miracle Matthew talks about of the other unnamed blind man who was healed probably contributed to this huge crowd that's a part of the triumphal entry, which we'll see when they come into Jerusalem. Remember, Lazarus got healed. Jesus had raised him from the dead. But now it's Bartimaeus and this this other person that we don't know whether they knew each other, they were friends, whatever, but but, but that that had something to do with the, 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 the growing crowd of people cheering, this is the Messiah. And we'll see that when we get to the triumphal entry, when, when, when the whole crowd is cheering, son of David. And they're saying, Hosanna, which literally means save us. They thought it's here. The kingdom is here. He's going to overthrow Rome, and it's all going to change. And by the end of the week, they're not saying that anymore. They're not saying son of David anymore. They're not even claiming him as a family member anymore. They're treating him as a common criminal, and they're yelling for his death. Well, verse 43 says, he was following Jesus on the road, glorifying God. You know, that's why we're here this morning. Did you think about that? You and I are on the road following Jesus, glorifying God. Somewhere along the way, we, we cried out for mercy, and, and Jesus stopped, and everything changed in our life forever. That's why we're here this morning. We're part of that that crowd of saints who's following the Savior. And you know what? There's some folks who need to join us today. Who need to say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, use me. And friend, when Jesus touches your life, the rest of us, we're going to praise God. And we're going to follow Jesus, and we're going to walk like we know where we're going. Let's pray.